Some would say that a research network is indispensable for an academic career. But what is a research network? How do you create one? What do you use it for? That is what we'll discuss here today. Welcome to the science conversations at NTNU. As always, I have some very interesting and skilled people here with me today who will share their experiences uh, on this area. They all collaborate and cooperate with researchers at different fields of uh, research at NTNU and all over the world. Erik Folven, you are an associate professor at the Faculty of Information Technology and Engineering. What is a research network to you? Oh, that's a good, good and broad question, I guess, with no simple answer. It's, it's a lot of things. It's um, from the local network at NTNU. It's uh, the PhD students that took their PhD uh, when I was a PhD student that I meet at conferences, I guess. And it's, of course, the more formal collaborators where you collaborate with research projects and joint publications and, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's a range of things from the small to the larger and more international research network, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Thea Selleos-Torsen, you're a professor at the Faculty of Humanities. Uh, do you, is it the same for you? Do you uh, regard the research network in the same way? Yes, of course, Eric is uh, right in his description of a, a research network. But I think uh, I may add that um, a research network actually consists of uh, persons and people. So um, um, that is, of course, uh, knowing people and having uh, common interests, common, common curiosities um, is also a very important aspect of a research network, I think. But what can you, what can you use a network for? How do you use your network? I think that um, from an overall perspective, I, I use my network to uh, pursue specific questions. Um, I, 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 other people often have different expertise and skills. And uh, I, yeah, I, I often think that, oh, this person must have the answer to my question. And sometimes they don't, but then they can um, give um, new perspectives or new information, which helps me to find questions so, um, I, I, and answers, uh, of course. Um, so, yeah. Ah. Sounds reasonable. That's what you can use them for, yeah. Yeah. Asger Tomaskar, mm -hmm. you're a professor at the Faculty of Economics and Management. So what if you are a PhD candidate and you work perfectly well on your own? Or if you haven't planned uh, a career in academia, do you still need to network? Yeah, I, I would say so. Of course, it, it depends also on, on your personal interest. For me, when I was a PhD student, uh, the, the reason that what is today a network was built was that uh, I found it very interesting. It was one of the best parts of being a PhD student was to discuss with the international researchers, visit international researchers. And, and of course, in my career as a professor, this has been very useful because then you know the people that do the same type of research, a different type of research. Uh, if I would have gone to industry, I'm sure I would still have been interested in some of the same topics and, and could benefit from having the same international and national network. But at that time, we didn't think of it as a network. We thought of this as interesting people right. to talk to. But today, your uh, network consists of both people within academia and industry, or is it more? Yeah, uh, you, you can say that after uh, after a academia. career in in academia, you you of course have still the the network, extended network that you built as a PhD student. Some of these are professors in in international institutions, national institutions. But as, as you go along and establish projects and corporations, you get uh, wider networks within different topics. For example, uh, when you establish EU projects, you, you would need to complement your networks with different type of competence. And, and when you work with the industry and government, you, you of course get, get uh, contacts and, and, and friends in, in other areas that are useful also when you want to establish new corporations and projects. Mm. Uh, Oskar mentioned that uh, as a PhD, he talked to uh, visiting researchers, is that something you did as well? Yeah, uh, and I think I was also incorporated in my, uh, my supervisor's network early on. 
and uh, that was a natural thing to do, that when you had uh, visiting researchers or you went to a conference and you went out to have a dinner in the evening, it, I was taken along and that was of course a very nice platform to build your your research network in the in the very beginning uh, and I, I agree with both what Thea and Oscar have said that of course it consists of people and if it's possible to grow your network in a kind of natural way because you like spending time with these people it's interesting to discuss then you're of course in a very good place then then it will that then it will work out for you to put it like that yeah so like, be interested and say yes whenever someone asks you for to join them for a coffee or dinner. That's, that's what I hear. That's probably a good <laughs> idea, yeah. Um, but how do you know when you are connected enough with someone to actually call it a network? Yeah. In my view, I think that's not a very important distinction to make. It's not like I count the number of people that, I, that are inside or outside my network. It's, I think once you are... You have, let's say, broken the ice, so it's easy to contact them. If you have a question, you you don't feel that there is a very big barrier to to make a contact. Then you have probably they are within your network, to put it like that. So uh, so it's uh, it's uh, it's not very important to to count them as such and and define your network very kind of rigidly. I think. Okay, but so as a if you are a PhD finishing your PhD degree. Uh, is there a number of uh, people you should know? Uh, uh, Thea, what do you think? Um, yeah, it's... Um, well, uh, I, I think it's really good if you try to uh, have, a, have a network uh, because um, it's sort of the X factor of academic life. It's a resource that sort of you don't really know what it contains, but it can be absolutely fantastic. And it comes in addition to your curriculum and your supervisor or whatever is in the infrastructure around you. So um, it's... Um, you should really try to uh, connect with people. Also, uh, of course, as a, in, in, in academia, you, you have this you, you infrastructure globally where you are welcome everywhere, uh, almost in, in the entire world, if, if you have this common um, uh, field. Uh, and, and so you should really um, yeah, take advantage of, of that very beneficial situation. Uh, but you have to make an effort. You have to step out there and and uh, and make connections with people. So it's um, it's also a bit tough, uh, of course, which is why we have this webinar, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's really uh, enriching. Yeah, Oscar, do you think uh, networking is tough? Uh, never consider it like, like that. Uh, for, for me, when I was a PhD student, I, I found it uh, very interesting to have lunch, have dinners, have academic conversations with those people. And, and then you start contributing into the research networks, the formal research organizations, and, and, and you get more involved. And, um, and in some respect, you could say it creates some additional work when you take on administrative duties in, into that type of organization, but it also gives you a lot in terms of contacts, and which is very helpful when you have questions that you would like an answer on, or, or if you need to send send uh, a letter to ask a cooperation uh, in, in a project, or if you have a PhD student that would like to go abroad. This, this is really the mechanism you have available to, to make your research more impactful and more efficient. And, but you never think of that as work, you just observe that as as the people you know, the number of people you, you know grows, these things become easier. Hmm. Hmm. But Thea, you did your master's thesis at the University of Oslo, had your PhD degree at the University of Bergen, you did your postdoc at NTNU, and along the way you had research uh, stays in Cambridge and Pisa in Oxford, all over the place. Uh, I guess it's fair to say that all these stays sort of made a nice fundament for your network. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but th that's also where the tough bit uh, comes in, I, I, I think, because uh, I, I, uh, my supervisor at B in Bergen uh, was very helpful and, and, and put me in touch with really good people. Uh, but I also had my own um, uh, stars, <laughs> so I, I really needed to go to these places where they 
worked. So I work on really ancient materials. So the fact that people are alive uh, is really uh, appealing. So I, I, I wanted to go especially to uh, Cambridge and Pisa and and. That was <laughs> that was really uh, tough um, because I didn't really know anyone, and I just yeah hung around at the events that uh, took place there, and and uh, after a while people <laughs> asked me sort of what I was doing there, <laughs> but then the ice was broken, and I um, I actually continued. Um, my, so this is ages ago, and and uh, uh, one of my uh, last publications in 2019 was was with one of of the professors I met there. So it's really worthwhile, or can be, even if it also can be quite tough. <laughs> so Eric, have you tried that? Uh, ever tried that uh, method of just hanging around long enough till someone uh, yeah, starts asking you what you're doing? Uh, I guess uh, I have no specific example, but I guess uh, most PhD students can can relate to the to being in a room full of people at the poster session or something like that. And there is, of course, a barrier to approach these guys that you have just seen their names at the end of the publication, right? And and uh, they are your academic superstars, as you say, in some respect. But uh, I think that's at least one message that I think uh, younger researchers should uh, should get is that don't be afraid of, of making that first contact because people are usually friendly and uh, are happy to be approached by a young and enthusiastic PhD student with some good questions. So Let's test. <laughs> are you, Aske, happy to be approached by young and eager PhD students? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the, the best part of being a professor is to meet young and intelligent people. So, so that's really enriching uh, when you could have these good conversations with, with well, both the professors and the, and the PhD students mm -hmm. internationally. And I would also add to this that um, uh, maybe one of the most important jobs for the supervisor would be to get uh, the PhD students into good sessions in international conferences and make sure that you meet some of the interesting people naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Either, either the young talents or, or the old superstars, like you say, in, in, in a natural setting that makes it possible to, for example, join for lunch after the, after the session. These things that come quite naturally. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's, of course, maybe you still have to be a little bit brave to, to, to join into some of these things, but uh, it, it's, it's also a natural thing to do. But so how could someone approach you? Would it be like, hi, would you come up to you at the conference and say, hi, would you like to join for lunch or should they yeah, say so something else? That's, that's uh, quite quite typical. You give a presentation, then uh, normally there is a nice uh, chat around the, the, the presentation, some talks after the session. And if you're really lucky, there is a good break with a, with a coffee machine or, or a lunch or something happening directly after. And yeah, I, I cannot even remember that someone has uh, ever been refused to join for dinner <laughs> in, uh, in, in something like this. So of course it can feel a little bit risky, but yeah. Most, most, most professors and um, international uh, researchers are very nice people. So, but, but I mean, it, 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 the only thing you need to be comfortable with it yourself, like you say, it's, it's, it's going to be a, the, uh, it's going to be the nice part of being at the conference. This, this, this social activities. It's called social activities, so you, you shouldn't feel it as stressing or a pressure or these things. I mean. Mm. This, this is this is there are many fun parts of being a professor, but this is supposed to be a fun part yeah. of, of being an. But I guess you have to uh, to make sure that you stay a bit away from your uh, everyday colleagues because that they will be there with you. I guess, is that something you you think actively? Because the easiest thing is just to, to hang around with those you already know. Yeah. So I, I think that uh, that's important. It's it's not a problem to to be with your colleagues either and you can meet together two groups for that matter but but to only do that to only look into your own let's say home environment that's that might be not the best choice in in the long term mm -hmm. there was one thing i would like to add also i think oscar touched upon it is this how do you approach them do you say okay i would like to go would you like to join us for a coffee i think it's very good if you can have this kind of seed which is founded in the topic, right, or in the research, then it's much easier. I, I think you should not point out the kind of superstars that you would like to meet just because they are superstars, to put it like that. You should try to identify where do I have some interesting discussions to 
to continue because I think that that's also what the other party would ben benefit uh, and, and, and appreciate, right? Because it's, it's a mutual thing, right? Yeah. I think it shouldn't be calculated. It should come yeah. natural. Like uh, you have an inter interesting conversation, and naturally you go and have a coffee, or yeah. you continue over lunch, and yeah. Mm. So it's. Uh, but I guess you could mention some publication done by the person, uh, because I mean, like say that it yeah. was interesting, and that I don't know <laughs> that uh, that you have some questions which are similar, perhaps, or yeah. Uh, I, I guess that is a, um, a point where you yeah. could start uh, talking. Or, or you could, of course, also do small talk. But uh, that wouldn't get you to, <laughs> to the um, academic stuff uh, immediately, at, uh, not, uh, no, at least. Yeah. I but I guess it also takes a bit of practice, this whole thing of actually picking up the courage to approach someone and then going from the small talk to sort of the next level. I has the weather, and yeah, yeah. then oh, you had a great paper. Uh, so practice. But what, what I feel is also that um, there are some preparations you could do in in respect that if you are in an active research group that uh, organizes uh, PhD schools, winter schools, summer schools, if you have international visitors coming, you naturally talk to to these people, and and it's natural to continue the conversation with people you met there when you go to conferences. So, I mean, the preparations you could do is to make sure that um, that uh, you are in a research group that actively stimulates international cooperation and, and invites. Um, and I, I have a feeling as a PhD student, you could also take initiative to do that. I mean, it's been difficult for a couple of years now to do this, the, these things in, in practice, but it's extremely important to have this international interaction. You could say the same with the national interaction, of course, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have asked postdoc Emil Översven to share his experiences with networking. Hello, my name is Emil Översven. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Sociology and Political Science. And today I have one practical experience and also a question. Now from the practical experience first, uh, I think that uh, for me early in my career, one thing that really helped me out a lot was uh, that I decided to submit some articles to the web page of the Norwegian Sociological Association, uh, sort of like a web magazine that they that they run. And um, doing so eventually got me a position at the uh, editorial board and afterwards also the opportunity to chair sessions at the annual sociology conference, which obviously has been uh, good for me in terms of getting to know people and getting uh, requests to do other stuff. So I would say that uh, try to network through your work, try to get in through something that you have done or something that you can contribute with uh, like more scientifically, I think, and just keep your name in the conversation and try to also be dependable that you actually do as you say that you're going to do because then it becomes easy for people to recommend you and uh, people also tend to, to pick you again if anything else should show up. Now as for the question, uh, it's really quite simple. It is about uh, what are the indications that you're actually uh, successful at networking. Uh, I know that a lot of us, we feel like we do this type of networking stuff, but it sometimes can be difficult to actually tell that we're succeeding uh, because the rewards can be quite far from the initial effort, so to say. So what are some signs that you can consider if you are uh, seeking to evaluate how good you are doing with your networking skills. Thanks. So uh, Emil touched upon some of the same things that you said that you that you can use your academic work as a starting point to to uh, sort of look for a place where you can contribute. And um, he also has this question of how is there some uh, mechanisms that can tell you whether you successful in your, work, in your networking or not? What do you think of that, Eric? Uh, it's a good question. Um, it's not something I've been very kind of aware of myself, I think. But uh, of course, you have this kind of feeling. Uh, if you could, can I name a couple of groups along the, uh, around the world where I would e could easily write an email without any kind of big doubts whether they would reply it or not? Mm. That's, that's probably one metric you could use. But um, and as he also mentions, it, it's very hard to know which kind of starting points for networks or, or contacts that will benefit you in the long run. That could be a very brief conversation at the conference that you 
some years later picked up on and remember we met some years back and and then it uh, turns into something great so so it, it's not very easy to to put a number on it i guess but uh i think sitting down and try to name a few places where you feel that you could easily make contact and and you think that they would remember you that's uh it's a good perhaps, start it's a good start at least yeah yeah but in the same time that uh you don't know when they will sort of come in useful for mm. you that's the same maybe you become the superstar mm. one day and uh, so they don't know when you will become useful for them either uh, what do you think of that, Sea? Um, do you have some success criteria? Well, um, I, I agree with Eric that um, the, 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 the contact that you know each other is, is, uh, is uh, also a sort of a reward uh, that you should uh, um, value. Um, but uh, of course, there, there may be various results. It may take very long time. Uh, publications tend to take a long time, but that can result from networks and is sh surely uh, a sign of success, I'd say. Uh, and also, of course, uh, projects, if you can um, um, make applications and, and have uh, successful funding of projects together, that's of course, um, or, or, or you can mention people you know and that will help you in, in, in the application. Uh, but I guess um, time is essential and you have to be patient and maybe also uh, not so uh, result orientated, uh, uh, but enjoy um, the good contact and maybe maybe you will get lucky and, and, and have some results. Yeah. But do you do some? Uh, do you take some active measures to maintain a contact over time? Because you'll meet at a conference and you'll have an, a, or you have some cooperation, and then years may pass before the next possibility. Do you like think of this and like send them an email saying, "Oh hi," or follow them on LinkedIn and? Yeah. Well, I I uh, I guess that uh, people are very busy, uh, so if you approach, I think it's. I, I don't know if I'm right, but I think it's polite to approach people if, if you have something important uh, to ask them or, or, or inform them about. Uh, and that would be appreciated, at least uh, those that I know. Uh, so not just uh, <laughs> writing random emails just to check if they still remember you. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't recommend that. But uh, then again, you can think of things that, you know, if you're interested in maintaining um, a particular contact, you can think of things that this other person might be interested in and, and, and ask about that. Or, yeah, so maybe be a bit smart, but uh, not too pushy, uh, I'd say, yeah. So, uh, Oscar, you touched upon it, but um, the pandemic has had a huge impact on on how young researchers can network and uh, removed so many possibilities for physical contact and, mm. and um, conferences, etc. So, could you say something more about uh, how researchers, not how um, supervisors and research groups can help their young, young ones to um, yeah. to get a network in these times? Yeah. So, so what we have been seeing is, of course, there is a number of webinars coming up to replace this this uh, previous interactions, and and I think. Uh, it's, it's a good opportunity. It could not completely replace what we had, but I think it's a good opportunity to be active in some of these, these new networks, virtual networks that shows up with, with weekly webinars or monthly webinars and these things. And, and professors could, of course, be helpful in getting PhD students in with both presentations and participation in, in, in those kind of discussions. What, what we are seeing now is that uh, when, when hopefully it's possible to organize um, PhD schools again, uh, it's very important to, to get these physical networks also back in, in track in terms of organizing winter schools, summer schools, and um, well, at least with us, we are actively working on at the first possible opportunity, we, we will start doing that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, I, I think what you're missing in these webinars is this informal chat mm -hmm. uh, that uh, builds trust and, uh, and, and bonds. Uh, and and, and um, yeah, I, I think we're really missing that part of it, all of us. Yeah. Do you work with that with your students and research groups? Uh, yeah, to, to to some extent at least, and um, I, I very much agree with what Oscar said. Uh, I think the the kind of the pandemic has opened some doors, 
and also closed a lot of doors, right? And uh, um, from my own experience, I see some webinar series which have been more or less administered by, by PhD students, for example. Mm. That has o obviously been a very good networking platform for them. So it's, uh, of course, new possibilities coming up uh, as well. But, um, but especially this point of this, the importance of the informal discussions in building trust. I think it's so much easier to really build this, to build trust, yeah, over a cup of coffee mm. than it is uh, through Teams or Zoom. But so how do you approach someone from the home office? I mean, then we're back to the emailing. You just saying hi is a bit, I mean, you need to, to bring something else to the table. How, yeah, yeah, any uh, suggestions? Yeah, uh, personally, I feel that during the pandemic, it has been enough for me to kind of, let's say, maintain my network rather than expanding it. And uh, kind of in the phase where you need to expand your network, I, I really see that this is difficult. But uh, what has been important at, and at least partly successful is to to make these kind of venues where you can try at least to have these informal discussions as well, to make room for something a little more than just the, the formal meeting, the discussion, also discuss the COVID situation or the weather or whatever, right? That, that you make room for this. I, I think that's at least something that you can, can try to do. So this kind of coffee machine meetings online. That's, uh, but that also, it means that as experienced researchers and professor, professors busy ones at that, you also have the, uh, so you need to make an effort to actually join those informal sessions because I guess it will be easy for you to say, oh, I don't have time for the informal, I go straight for the webinar. Uh, do you think of that? Yeah, it, this is what we're missing because you're right. Uh, yeah. uh, as busy professors, you normally don't have time or take time or, or you're not meeting the people you would like to meet. So one example, uh, if you attend an international conference where there normally are 5,000 people, I mean, the mm -hmm. breaks is, is, is maybe the most important part of the conference where you can chat to people. This doesn't work yeah. virtually yeah. in a conference with, with 5,000 people. Maybe you're lucky and you have a good chat after your session. Mm -hmm. But, um, but so th this is what we have been missing. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. and one important aspect there is the, the traditional way of, of traveling to conferences. You set aside that week to some extent. You are in the bubble, but that's much harder now. The online conferences, you can always take mix in a meeting or whatever in between. And that's, uh, that's a great loss. Yeah, so, so one advice would be if, if you've not been able to do that now for the last two years, prioritize to do it yeah. when, when it opens up. That's, yeah. um, I was just going to say the same, but of course, uh, 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 the PhD students are younger <laughs> now, and also um, um, they they have different habits in terms of uh, screens and uh, yeah. Uh, so maybe it's not as hard uh, for them as it is uh, <laughs> for us. But uh, still, I would really recommend uh, everybody to go and see real people um, as soon as they can. Yeah. Uh, so, but something we haven't talked about so far. Uh, is social media is as a tool for networking. And we have asked postdoc Brooke Wolford to uh, share with us how she uses social media for networking. As a graduate student and now a postdoctoral fellow, I have had a great experience expanding my scientific network on social media. Many senior scientists in my subfield of genomics and statistical genetics are quite active on Twitter. We even have Twitter meetups at our annual professional society meeting. People frequently post their career transitions or job announcements so I can keep up with many potential career options. Perhaps most importantly, scientists share their preprints from BioArchive or MedArchive along with the Twitter thread summarizing the results. They frequently invite discussion from the community as a sort of live peer review. This allows for connections between scientists and strengthens the research. After platform talks at various conferences, I've been able to continue the discussion from the Q&A session on Twitter as well. Twitter has been a great resource for me to learn from the career paths of senior scientists, keep up with current research, and connect with my peers and new collaborators. So Brooke uses Twitter actively and learns about career options and, um, and can go into discussions uh, with authors looking for feedback on preprints. And she also uses Twitter as a follow-up after conferences. Does anyone of you use social media for 
networking? I don't think I'm the right one to educate anyone <laughs> on the use of social media, but uh, I, I can partly relate to what she is saying about Twitter. I think that's probably one of the better platforms uh, and I've partly used it myself, but uh, I think this is one of the places where the younger gen generation yeah. will definitely behave differently uh, from what we are doing. Uh, and this is probably something that will be quite important in their networking for the years to come. So. I'm so sure for, that, uh, for them to be able to meet you guys there, you have to step it up. Yeah, yeah that's, that's true. That's <laughs> yeah. true. Um, Actually, uh, I, I have lots of uh, friends, especially American colleagues uh, uh, on Facebook. Uh, but that's a really weird <laughs> social medium uh, because you, yeah, you see all, all, all the all the personal stuff, which is, of course, also very nice. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's the best uh, uh, social medium platform. Um, but the young people probably know that already. <laughs> I have a feeling Facebook is sort of already out, outdated uh, to some extent or for older people. <laughs> yeah. But so what kind of uh, practical tools do you have to create and maintain a network? Do you use a little, I don't know, a little black book to note down names and what you talked about or a large stack of business cards or a mailing list or any practical so, tools? So for me, I have my email archives going back 15 years with, with all the emails I communicated with people internationally. Of course, that's a bit old fashioned, but very useful. And um, and I, I think uh, if, if you look at one advantage we, we old people have, we can still use the phone to call people one to one bilaterally, <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> yeah. surprisingly Daring. efficient. Daring, yeah. <laughs> and it's very different from a Teams meeting where you talk to 10 people to, to have a, mm -hmm. a small chat. How about you? Any practical tools? I guess I also lean to my email uh, <laughs> archive. <Yeah. laughs> I, I feel almost inclined to, 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 to uh, refer to something even more uh, old fashioned. Namely, I mean, when you go to conferences, there's normally abstracts and yeah, uh, information uh, about what's happened. And if you study that a bit afterwards and then think of something you can ask people about, then, then that would uh, mm -hmm. ha has often been a, a, a gateway um, for me. Um, but that's not even social. <laughs> yeah, but that's a good advice. Yeah. It's a very practical tool. It's a tool, yeah. Yep. Mm. yeah. Uh, so another question. Uh, can you be introvert and hate small talk and still manage networking? Yeah, I think, uh, think I would probably be closer to that category myself. So, but you, you have to, we never thought of it as networking or useful. Uh, this, this was uh, for me always an interesting part of traveling and having guests, mm -hmm. uh, talking to colleagues and, uh, and gradually you then build what you would call networks, even if you probably never think of it as, as useful or networks, you think of this as, yeah, you see the benefits, of course, when you're going to organize a conference or a winter school that you know people. Mm -hmm. But, um, but um, I would say, um, at least for me, it is, hasn't been very carefully planned. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I, for me to be comfortable with it, it, it also has to come naturally. Mm -hmm. How about you? Have you forced a bit? Uh, no, I, I think I can, can relate quite much to what Oscar says. Uh, I, I think you will need to have your, the growth of your network at the pace which you are comfortable with. Some people can maintain a lot of contacts and have a very kind of broad and rich uh, network in numbers, but for others it's, it's uh, more important to have these fewer closer contacts. It's almost like making friends in, in outside yeah. academia life, I would say. So I, I think it's important to find your way, yeah, I think. How about you there? Well, um, I guess, of course, um, it's, it's tough to, to, uh, to have a, or, or make a career in academia. And, and so um, it's very um, natural <laughs> to, to, to think about how you, how you can do that in, in the best way. But I think, uh, I think that in the end, um, at least, well, you also have to have passion uh, and be genuinely curious 
and mm. interested in in yeah finding out new things <laughs> really and and that is real as opposed to feigned or or you do it to pretend mm. uh, to be interested in something because it might be beneficial for your career i it, it shouldn't yeah, uh, I don't think that will work actually. Uh, also, because I, there, there are there are mostly introverts <laughs> in academia, <laughs> and and they are there because they are passionate about um, their subject, and and you will only connect with them, I think, if if you can share that, um, and. Um, and that's actually how it, it, it has happened in, in the most important contacts I've made. Uh, has, has, I, 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 sometimes it's been with people I, I don't really know if they really sort of enjoy talking to me, or, or, but, but, but they come back with lots of information and, and apparently <laughs> there's, uh, uh, we, we, we're sort of on the same quest, uh, but this, I, the social bit can also be um, a bit obscure, uh, perhaps, but at least the, 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 the question that you pursue is the same, and, 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 and there's definitely passion about that. Yeah. So find the shared passion. I think so. Uh, we've gotten some uh, questions and comments from the audience. The first one is uh, related to social media again. What about using LinkedIn and have a, the list of contacts there? But I guess you guys wouldn't know. Uh, <laughs> I think it sounds like a good idea. Yeah, so I myself, I use LinkedIn, not for, for what you would call this uh, interaction between persons, but for just uh, large scale dissemination of information. Mm. Mm. Uh, another question here is, uh, what about network outside of academia? Is it crucial when you're looking for a job after the PhD? Uh, of course, it was never crucial for me who stayed within academia, but I think networking is always a good thing, both if you want to be strategical, but mostly because that's, I would say, what, make li what makes life fun, right? Uh, meeting people and having friends, that's basically what networks is about, right? And uh, I think that's, that's important regardless, but of course, Knowing people is always important when you want to make that next step. It's, it's always easier to employ someone where you have heard from a close friend or something that this is a nice guy. Um, I was wondering, are there any like unspoken rules of networking or interpersonal communication that you know exist in, I don't, I don't know, outside Europe or have you come across, or maybe you, maybe you never discovered it? You just made, mista made mistakes and didn't know, or <laughs> probably. But yes, I guess academia is all is still one of these kind of places where you have these hierarchies and and something that is a bit yeah, not so natural for us Norwegians at least. I think so. So there are many places in the world where approaching someone higher in the hierarchy is expected to happen in a in a certain fashion with some kind of respect mm. to put it like that so i think that's it, it especially in writing and, uh, if you write an email don't be too uh, casual, or casual i guess uh, at least in the first email it, it, it's never dangerous to actually use their professor title and, and be a little bit uh, that way but you had a comment on that too. yeah yeah it's of course there, there there there's plenty of opportunities to mess up and uh, and offend people <laughs> so in academia there are all i mean people are are difficult <laughs> can be at least so and also in academia of course so um i guess um that comes back to the to the tough part again i mean if you if you do mess things up or, or, or offend someone, I, I think that's okay. Because uh, okay, not every contact is going to flourish or last forever. Um, hopefully this will not create a huge problem for you. And, and you should, uh, should try to pick up the courage to try again and with different people. And also I think uh, the best... Um, Research collaboration uh, emerges from 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 yeah contact where you really have chemistry and and get along like 
friendly. <laughs> uh, friend is actually a very uh, good keyword. Of course, it's not the same as a friend, but I, I guess you also have experienced that coming to conference and meeting completely uh, strange people or, or strangers <laughs> and, and, and discovering that you have more in common with these strangers <laughs> than you have with most people you actually see on a daily basis. <laughs> it's really weird and, and has something to do with friendship in a way. Yeah, and passion. So, um, is there anything you wish that you'd known when you started out as a young researcher about networking or how to create um, connections with other people? Yeah, I'm not sure if I've worried too much about these things when I was a young researcher, but Just I, would, I would probably be happy, happy to know that it worked out. <laughs> but well, I, I'm not sure if I've worried too much about it. So, I mean, for, for me, this job as a professor, even when, when a PhD student, it's more of a lifestyle than, than a job. So, so I think uh, probably young, young Oscar would have been happy to know that it worked out. But, um, but um, I'd not be so nervous about it. But um, yeah. How about you, Thea? Is there something you would have Well, I, I, I really, I know, I know what networking is when we're talking about it, but I, I n never went out to sort of network uh, as, uh, as mm. had that idea or that yeah. motive uh, but um, yeah again it's it's when when you when you are in this academic world you're actually part of a greater community mm. and to sort of really bring that to its fruition is is really going to heighten your <laughs> your experience uh, as a person and human and academic so so I guess that was the pull um, that made me go to these places and, and, and stay in touch with, uh, with my network. Um, so I don't know if that was an answer, but yeah. Uh, yeah. That was a good answer. Yeah. Um, Eric, uh, would you say there are some skills that you should have that are, are valuable for networking or that you should try to sort of train or acquire? Uh, it's uh, at least, of course, it's again, building trust, right? So being able to listen and see things from the people, person you meet from that perspective, that's, that's important because it, for it to be a good kind of collaboration, there needs to be something in it for both sides. I think that can be difficult to realize as a young PhD that there can be something in it for the uh, high-flying professor, but remember that you can be the one bringing new ideas to the table or some new techniques that you master that he doesn't have in his lab or whatever, right? So, so also take on those glasses that, okay, there should be something in it for both of us. But again, it's about being good at talking to people and listening and being nice. In a sense. So we are approaching the end. So that sort of brings me to the, to the last question. Do you have some sort of a take home message to the audience? Anyone? Tia? Well, let, let, let your curiosity drive you. Mm. That's my message to two people and you will make friends and probably long lasting uh, collaborations. Yeah. How about you, Eric? Yeah, and I think find your own style, which you are comfortable with. Don't think that you should do this by the book. I don't think that would work. You, there is no such thing as a recipe that you can follow. You will need to interact with people as you are comfortable with. And this might be very different from person to person. Oscar, any yeah. take home message? Yeah, remember that you are in this because it's fun. Work with people that you like to work with. Yeah. Thanks all of you. So we have talked about research networks, what they are, how you can create them and how they can be of use for you. We hope that you've gotten some inspiration and new ideas. Thank you to all the contributors and to those contributing on video. Welcome back to the next Science Conversations uh, on March 10. The topic will be uh, plagiarism and ethics. And until then, keep the conversation going. <laughs>